Greetings and welcome to Faith Connections. I'm so glad you've joined us today. Today we continue our study that focuses on listening to the Messiah, and rightfully so because he is the master teacher, and he often used parables to teach. It was his distinctive method of teaching in the Synoptic Gospels. Though he did not always teach in parables, it certainly was his primary means of teaching. So he's the master teacher. So we would do well to listen. Parables often appear to be rather simple, but they contain profound truth that instructs us, enlightens us, challenges us, and even confronts us when we hear. They invite those who hear to perceive beyond what we might first see or to even understand a deeper truth beyond what we initially hear. For instance, uh, Nathan confronts King David with sinful behavior by telling him a story. He tells him a story of a rich man who has many flocks and a poor man who has only one lamb. It's in 2 Samuel chapter 12. And it is an avenue by which Nathan confronts David with sinful behavior. And it certainly makes the point. That is the intention of a parable. Everyday circumstances that we would understand that makes a point. In the Gospel of Matthew, the teachings of Jesus are organized into five neat little sections. So there's a Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5 through 7. Mission in Matthew 10, the parables of the kingdom in Matthew 13, uh, the church in Matthew 18, and the coming of the Son of Man in Matthew 24 through 25. At the center of those teachings are seven teachings about the kingdom of heaven. And, and the parable of the sower is the first of those seven teachings. So again, Jesus is using parables to teach, and he uses everyday life and everyday objects like families and farming and trees to speak to the kingdom of God. Now, what's really well, almost rare about this particular parable of the sower, it appears in all three of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And it's also powerful in that it not only gives us the parable, but it gives us an explanation and an interpretation of the parable. So I want to invite you to go with me to Matthew chapter 13, verses 1 through 9, and uh, verses 18 through 23. And I'm going to make an effort to share that scripture with you on the screen today so that you can follow along. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched. And they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still others fell on good soil, where it produced a crop a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was saw. Whoever has ears, ears, <laughs> let them hear. Whoever has ears, let them hear. Listen then to what the parable, this is verse 18, listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes. It snatches away what was sown in their hearts. This is the seed sown along the path. The seed falling on, falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. 
The seed falling among the thorns is someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. So there's, there's this large crowd that hears Jesus speak, such a large crowd that he changes position and gets into a boat. And he's in the seated position as he teaches, which was customary of his day. And it's remarkable that in this setting with Jesus in a boat and the crowd on the shore, a large crowd, that there's this natural amphitheater where Jesus is able to speak to the people on the shore. Archaeology and Literary evidence shows us that first century Mediterranean world, the first century Mediterranean world, knew how to communicate to large audiences without the benefit of a modern day sound system. Now, the story begins with this. The farmer sowed his seed. And everything after this proceeds from that statement. This parable begins with action. And the explanation that follows a little later uh, depends on this beginning. Jesus sort of recasts this story with a familiar activity of sowing seed uh, to a call for you and I to share the message about the kingdom of God. We, in this story, are the sower. And we have been called to sow the seed of the gospel. We should be mindful in this story that the sowing of the seed has a much larger meaning than just personal evangelism. And I believe in that. And that's, that's, that's necessary. But it, but it is about living in such a way that our life reveals and points to the kingdom of God. And it points to it in such a way that it, it tells us that the kingdom has something to say about life and living. Now, here's what it would say to us. It's about speaking the gospel and living the gospel. It takes both. Sowing the seed of the kingdom is... Um, it's different from us for us than maybe the old ancient farm because our sowing of the seed is by nurturing relationships with non-believers, serving those who are in need, being a peacemaker in a world that is filled with conflict. When we bring the presence of the kingdom into our world, we are sowing seed. If the sower sows his seed, the gospel, the seed will find its way to the soil. I want you to hear that again. If the sower sows his seed or her seed, the, the seed will find its way to the soil. Now, Jesus might have seen a farmer in the distance um, sowing seed in the field, and he directed the crowd's attention that, that direction. Whether, whether that's the case or not, it would have been something these folks knew very well. Immediately, his audience would have made connection. I, I love this part of the story and that the farmer who was skilled had learned to sow his seed, to scoop it up in his hand and sow his seed across his field and to do so with, uh, with great skill and to, and to do so evenly. Now, this farmer, this first century farmer in Galilee, did not live in houses located on the land that he farmed. He lived in a village and walked out to his field. And, and that meant that there was this beaten path that could be found along the edges of the fields that extended out from the village. All farmers walked that path until they were beside their field. And then the farmer prepared his soil for planting, usually with this single wooden plow pulled by an ox or a donkey. And so plowing the field, he broke up the soil enough that it might fall on the scratched up dirt 
and the path itself was not plowed because it was it was beaten to a hard flat surface and if seed fell on it it would just lay on top and the birds could come and easily consume it so here's what happens is Jesus describes four soils that describe how people respond to the gospel. Now, Dr. David Busick called the sower of the seed in his ordination sermon last year. He called the ordinands to be crazy farmers, to sow their seed um, on the fields. And, um, and some of it, he says, as we've heard, well, there's different kinds of, of soil. So let's work our way through those really quickly. Uh, there's uh, the soil of that. Um, in fact, I want to go back for a second just to, for us. I want to identify those soils for those um, just so we got it clear. So there's this soil that is um, the hard path. That we just described and and it, and it is it is the path of those who who hear the gospel but they don't understand the gospel and so the evil one comes and takes it away and then there's this rocky soil so there's the hard path there's the rocky soil where um, the rock just lies under the surface and the plant springs up really quickly when the sun comes out because it has no roots it quickly fades so those are the folks who receive it but when hardship comes they quickly fall away and then there's the the thorns the the seed that's sown among the thorns and um there's the uh worries of this world, the enticement of this world, the deceitfulness of, of, uh, of wealth that makes the seed unfruitful because the weeds, the thorns and the weeds choke it out. But then there's this good soil that produces a good crop. I read where if you got 10 times the harvest of what you had sown, that was a great harvest. But Jesus speaks of a harvest that's 100 times, 60 times, 30 times. Wow. I mean, can you imagine that? This is the one who hears and understands. These are the disciples who make disciples. So the different soils produce different results. But, but the point of the parable is not this strategic analysis of the preferred soils, but it's helping us understand that sowing of kingdom seed is inherently an uncertain project. We, we can sow seed, but we can't always control the soil. Unlike the farmer, we can't even clearly identify who is receptive and who will not be receptive. We should realize that there are parts of this process that are out of our control. We're called to spread the seed regardless of the soil. There's another aspect of this that is not really illustrated in the parable, but is is relevant to our conversation today. And we find that in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6. Paul writes, I planted the seed. Paul watered it, but God made it grow. In other words, sowing seed may involve multiple layers, multiple people. Not every worker will sow and harvest what they have sown. Some will sow faithfully, but never see a harvest. Others will harvest where they did not so, but our task is to share the kingdom, to be sowers of the sea. Uh, the reality is that when someone comes to a commitment to Christ, typically there are a number of people who have contributed along the way. 
and all are critical to the final harvest. All of them have been faithful in some way of spreading the seed into their lives, contributing to the final result. While our attention often is drawn to the various soils, the primary message of the parable focuses on two things, the sower who sows the seed and the one who gives the harvest. Let's not get those confused. We are called to be sowers of the seed, the gospel. It is God who gives the harvest. So this is a clear answer to the uncertainties of the soil where we may sow. We can't always know when the soil will be receptive, nor will we always witness a harvest, but we do not farm alone. The Holy Spirit is, is an ever active partner. He has already been at work in the lives and hearts of every person we encounter. We call that provenient grace, wooing them, drawing them to God. The calling and the drawing is the work of God in every heart, everywhere. We, we don't actually begin the work. The Holy Spirit's at work way ahead of us. We never create the harvest. God is the one who brings about the harvest. That's God's work. And he's promised that he would bring about a harvest. It's not about really our skill, but it's about our obedience because he will produce a harvest. So let me ask you today, what are some of the ways in which you are sowing seed and making the kingdom of God present in the world around you? We are called to be sowers of the seed. But I also want to ask the question today, what type of soil are you? I don't know where you are spiritually in your journey, but I want to ask you the question, what, what type of soil are you? Are you the beaten down path where you hear the gospel but don't understand? Are you the rocky soil and when trials and tribulations come along, it's kind of short-lived? Or are you among the thorns where the worries of this world and the deceitfulness of wealth have made the seed in your heart unfruitful? I think we all want to be where the seed is sown and God does the work and brings about in our own life a way in which we live and speak that reflects the presence of the kingdom. He said if we would be obedient, then he would give us a harvest 100 times, 60 times, 30 times beyond what was sown. How will you be the presence of the kingdom in the world around you? What type of soil are you today?